Okay, I'm going to start off uh, uh, with it's going from the simple, from, I guess, from the, from the ridiculous and the sublime, or the sublime to the ridiculous or whatever, but the most simple ones first. Uh, I didn't bring this because it was too heavy uh, and inconvenient, but uh, the, our first most obvious source of off grid cooking is uh, open fire, uh, a fire pit or a, a grill or a, a, put a grill over it. Uh, can you think of good of advantages of, of uh, doing something like that? Anyone know some good reasons to use an open fire or, or a grill? Yes. Yeah, that oven will get there. Yes, uh, that's what that's, it's great. It works great. It's easy. It's quick and easy. It uses renewable fuel. You don't have to have uh, canisters. You don't have to have briquettes. You can just build a fire with what you've got. Uh, can you think of any limitations with I, I see you. you give, what's your name? Rita. Rita. Rita, Rita what are the limitations? Run out of wood. And yeah. your tree can't just cut down a burning tree. So you better store some wood, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah that's that's a good idea. Any other limitations? A hand over here? Sorry, just a second. Okay, no problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Well, here's a limitation. The as well. You can't control the heat as well. And uh, you're, you're, you're a bit limited if, if all you have is just a grill. Uh, you're not going to be baking, you're not, unless you're using a, um, a Dutch oven. Uh, you're not going to be uh, uh, slow cooking things, uh, but you're going to be doing pretty fast. One of the better things I've seen for a portable wood burning grill, now, let's see, for a portable wood burning grill, uh, it's one that we picked up at the Ronde at the Mountain Man Rendezvous a few years ago uh, in Wyoming. Uh, we didn't bring it because it, that thing is just unbelievably heavy, and uh, uh, we didn't want to haul it down here and haul it back and all that stuff. But it's probably about half the length of this uh, table. It's made of cast iron. Uh, you can set it fired. It has a grill over it, and it's got some upright poles on it that you can hang hooks. It has hooks from it, and if you were stuck in a situation where you did not have any non-renewable fuel and you were fairly uh, stable in your location, it would be an excellent, excellent uh, way to manage your open fire and grill. Okay, now, now the, another con is you cannot use this in, you can't, it's, it's a little difficult to do an open fire and grilling indoors unless you've got a real fireplace and even that's a bit challenging. Okay, so what do you do if you have to pack up and move out or whatever? Uh, when, when we have gone camping a lot, I've used this little Coleman camp stove right here. Now it's a, it sets up like this, and it's got a, got a canister here. You have this little uh, gizmo right here that. Uh, Plugs in. There's a little outlet here. You, plug, you you basically plug it in and plug the canister to it, and it fuels it. And uh, you can, can control your heat. Uh, you can boil things. You can. Uh, uh, there, there are actually Coleman uh, camp ovens. So Kenneth has used his Coleman camp oven uh, on campouts. Put it on top of the camp stove, and then it works as it traps the heat. It works as an oven. Uh, it. Uh, I actually have one, but I can't make any claim to fame with it because I haven't messed with it yet. So you know, until you've tried it, uh, you're not entitled to talk about it, right? Uh, but uh, you can control the heat. Um, there's some really good uh, reasons for using uh, a grill like this. I, I use, I've used it, uh, I've been on a lot of campus and I've used it in every one of them. Very reliable. Anyone think, I've given you some good reasons for it now. Can anyone think of some reasons why it might not be a the ultimate ideal uh, uh, solution, can it? Run out of fuel. The easiest one. It lasts about two, two and a half days cooking. Uh, yeah. Yes. And the, we actually have some a larger propane tank at home uh, to do that with. But uh, again, we've we've uh, they, we've stayed we've saved off the day of destruction for a few more months, but we're still going to run out. So that um, also another thing, 
you cannot use this indoors. Uh, I had a friend, uh, an interesting experience. I was walking down the street and suddenly this little voice told me to go visit my friend. So I went inside and found that she wasn't home, but her daughter was. And her daughter thought she had the flu. She was sick uh, and just uh, really having a hard time getting around. And uh, I looked around and they had a camp chef uh, grill inside their house. It's a propane fired camp chef. It's a good unit, but uh, what happens with a camp chef and uh, propane in the house is you get a buildup of uh, carbon monoxide. And they were using this because they were renting the downstairs and there wasn't, there was sort of a kitchenette down there, but no oven, uh, no stove. So, and they were using that. Uh, my friend's boyfriend uh, loaned her his camp chef and they were using it in the uh, family room to cook on. And I said, excuse me, but uh, I don't think you've got the flu. I think you've got carbon monoxide poisoning. And I, I turned out my, my neighbor upstairs, who was living upstairs was having uh, some sickness problems too. So it was affecting the whole household. So uh, I had not take the uh, camp chef out of the uh, house uh, and put it outside. I said, you can't use it in the garage either because it'll just filter into the house. And then I, I had... At that time, I had a, a butane unit, uh, which is a, a comparable idea to this. Uh, let me put this down so I can. <clears throat> this is a very, this is a comparable unit. This is a butane stove. It's a, a single burner. This uh, container, this compartment right here holds a butane canister. I didn't bring any butane canisters because I didn't want to open up my boxes and make a big mess and just uh, wave it around here. But just assume it's a butane canister in there. It's about the same concept. It'll take it'll, a butane canister will last you oh two two and a half days of cooking. Uh, the good thing about butane is you can use it in the house. So if you have a disaster, a short-term disaster, but the bad thing is just like the propane you're going to run out of it. It doesn't matter how much you store, you're going to run out of it. You can't refill the bottles. So uh, the, the butane unit is a really good, the, the, the propane unit is really good for camping and outdoor cooking. The butane unit is really good for, uh, in, for uh, when you need to cook indoors during a short-term power outage. So, uh, and they, they were, actually, my friend actually kept my butane unit. I had to buy a new one. And it, so this is the new one. But uh, it possibly saved their lives. Yes, Sarita. The propane, yes. Not, not for the butane. Another, another problem with butane is that you don't plan on using it if it's below freezing. It doesn't work very well. You have to heat it up to above freezing temperatures. But uh, if the power, if, if we had a problem like they had down in Texas where the power went down for two weeks, and it wasn't below freezing. I guess it got below freezing there a little bit. But um, if uh, if you had if you had one of these, you'd be able to cook and, and support yourself inside without going outside in the rain. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are you going to talk about that? Yes. Okay. But go ahead and make point. Well, we have another award, and they have done a lot. They, I think with little rice, you just boil it for one minute, and then you put it in the thermal. Well, you boil it rice, you want to boil it probably about two to four minutes, depending on the size. Yeah, but, but that's the concept. Tag on. Good job. Same for beans. Yeah. I'm going to specifically talk about beans and rice in a thermal cooker. Nice intro. But that, but that, that's a great way to save your fuel. Okay. Now, another thing uh, we have is uh, various camp stuff. And grills. I'm going to turn the time over to John to do that. He's please bang on that. First of all, sorry about the sun. You can blame it on global warming. Don't worry. Special laser pack. Okay. To answer a question that I got earlier, this shirt is displays. Uh, my contempt for uh, social media in the form of uh, uh, 
or what do they call that? Chart. Anyway. If you came here for politically correct comments, yeah. you came to the wrong place. <laughs> okay. I used to be a scout master, and I would demonstrate all these cooking methods that scouts use, buy and use. Each one of them has warts. In fact, everything on this table has warts. There, there are times when you just can't use each thing on this table, and there are times when it's exactly the right thing. These are very small uh, ways to, uh, to cook. This, this is an S-bit stove. It was invented by the Germans, used in the Second World War, and it's still in production. Here's a new one. Uses it uses little uh, uh, fuel pellets. Um, this is uh, trioxane. There's another one here. I can't remember the name of it, but uh, this one leaves ash. Trioxane doesn't, but trioxane is more expensive. Whatever. Um, but it's it's a single person cooker. Very small folds up into a little box and you can put a little package of these of these uh, trioxane bars in there. I suppose you could. Thank you. Um, well, if you if you have briquettes, you have to have two of them together or they'll go out. I discovered that. Okay. This is called a Svea, S-V-E-A. Get them on eBay. It's an alcohol stove. You dump alcohol in the middle and you light it. Now, of all the fuels, alcohol has the least amount of BTU volume. So it's a relatively inefficient stove. And also, alcohol burns really, really clean, which means there's a very faint blue flame, and it's hard to tell when it's on unless you pass your hand over, and you can tell if it's on or not. Okay? You keep your alcohol in one of these things, and if you can read German, great. You can get denatured alcohol. This is 100% alcohol at the paint pile in... Uh, any place that sells paint. Now there's. What was that called again? What? Denatured, no, two different Denatured bottles. Denatured alcohol. And the other bottle. Oh, this one? It's just. <laughs> <laughs> it came with it. Okay. We all know about these stoves. Um, they, they're they very tiny. They, this one fits in here. And you screw them on top of one of these. Now these have uh, propane and isobutane, which means that if you're up high or it's really cold, the isobutane will not burn. Your flame will go out and you'll shake this thing and there's still stuff in it. And then you get mad at the company. No, it, it's because it's cold. Okay. Another problem with one of these things, screw this into the top of one of these. You put your pot on top, you've got the wind blowing all the heat away. So what do you do? You put, you put a piece of cardboard or something as a windscreen. But what happens, you reflect all the heat back to your fuel canister when you put a, a windscreen close by. And this becomes what we call in scouting call a pocket rocket because you'll hear this fuel boil, then it'll go pew right up in the air. Okay. Now the way you get around that is by getting one of these. You put your fuel canister here and your pocket rocket here, and then you could put a windscreen between them. I've made all these mistakes, by the way. Now this one, there is there is nothing more uh, if as far as um, as far as BTUs per volume as gasoline. 
This is gasoline. Okay. Never, ever, ever light a gasoline stove in an enclosed area like your tent. Never light this anywhere around your tent because your tent is synthetic. And when you light one of these things, you, you plug one of these bottles in here. This has got your gasoline in it. Then you pump it up like that. You put some pressure in here. Then you leak a little bit down into the bottom and you light it and you get a soccer ball size flame. Woo. Okay, and then you've got to let it burn down a bit and, and heat up. And this gasoline stove is extremely hot and extremely efficient. I recommend it only for outside use. Um, now we've all heard of MREs. There are MRE heaters. What you do to activate the MRE heater, you, you take the MRE out of, out of here, you put the MRE bag in here after you cut this off. Then this is a chemical heater and you, and you put water in up to, up to the level it tells you. It says, do not overfill, don't overfill it. Okay, this is a single use item. Okay. And that's it. And I'll turn the type. Oh, yes. One more thing. This has got a little piezo lighter on it. These wear out. Therefore, you have to go to Snow Peak and buy yourself a couple of replacements when you get one of these piezo uh, stoves. Because eventually they'll wear out. And of course, we all know the problems with all of these camp stoves, which is what? When you run out of fuel? Yeah. That's it. Okay, Linda, okay. you're up. I, I can follow up with that. I took my, my son and I went up uh, uh, backpacking in the High Uinta a, a few years ago, and we thought we'd have an extravagant breakfast before we set, set out in the form of uh, bacon and eggs and all the trimmings. and. Uh, if we were up above 6,000 feet, and by the time we finished breakfast, we had we were, we had a, a little camp stove comparable to one of these. We'd used half our half our gas, and for the rest of the trip. And so that was a okay. Okay, now we, now what are we going to do? Well, fortunately, I had packed so that we had uh, some non-cookable items that we ended up using for our lunches, and we really minimized did minimal cooking for the rest of the trip and that we made it home okay but uh, you can run out of gas with things faster than you realize and if you don't have an alternate mean of, means of cooking you've got trouble i think one of the points i i, I hope comes through loud and clear as we discuss this and i'll make it and i'll make it again is you need to have multiple modalities of cooking you can't just depend on one modality for off-grid cooking because they all have pros and they all have cons and Fred is nodding her head yes. Um, we have some experienced people here. Yeah. Sadder now, but wiser. Yes. Uh, fortunately, we weren't sadder on our trip, on our uh, backpacking trip. We made it through. Uh, but we also ended up using, it's always nice to fall back on what you, what's uh, natural. We, we did have some campfires and cooked some campfires rather than uh, on the um, nice little things. But, okay, now now progressing onward, uh, yes. Uh, I have a rocket stove. You said I have to have two brisket units for cats. Yep. Or oh, if you're using charcoal briquettes and you light them, you've only got one briquette there, it will go out. If you get two briquettes, they keep each other company. But you can experiment with that. Now, um, now, now we've started off with, with, the, with the obvious, uh, um, the stuff that they sell in the, in the stores and stuff like that uh, that everybody uses that call for not basically non-renewable fuel. We're going to get into some stuff that you can use renewable fuel with. Uh, one of these, uh, and that minimizes your fuel usage, one of these is a rocket stove. 
Now, there are several different kinds of rocket stoves you can use. Uh, this one is this one's a commercial one. This is a little uh, wind gate to keep the wind from blowing uh, things down. Uh, the way you use a rocket stove is is pretty nice. You don't have to have a big pile of lumber. So someone over here mentioned that uh, uh, if you run out of lumber, you got trouble. Com comment here. Did you raise oh, your hand? Okay. No, I just asked about the bridge. Okay. Yeah. And so how much lumber do you put in? One or two sticks? Okay. Now, now for, for, uh, for one of these rockets, so you're not putting lumber in. The, 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 the field goes in here. You're using sticks, you're using twigs and leaves and stuff like that. Stuff that you can just pick up off the ground. So even if you don't have a saw, a chainsaw, and you don't have firewood, you can still use a rocket stove. You, you can shred up your wood too, but uh, it uses us a minimal amount of wood. That, that The good news is that you don't have to have expensive piles of wood. Uh, you can work off uh, the, basically the ground cover. The bad news is that you have to feed it constantly. You can't just go on and uh, leave it. So, I mean, we don't have any ideal solutions to the problem. Uh, so this one, this one's a, a relatively good one. There are a variety of different uh, designs you can use for rocket stoves. This is a commercial one. It's a stove tech. It's very good. Uh, a few years ago, some of us uh, uh, went uh, to one of our friends' houses and made a bunch of them out of, uh, uh, out of uh, gosh, number 10 cans and uh, uh, filled them all up and stuff like that. And they're good. You can, there are a variety of different designs on the market. They're great. They really minimize your use of fuel. Uh, you cook on them, you're going to do something like this. You're going to light your fire. And I'm not going to light a fire today, uh, but and then you can you can put your pot and uh, let's see here's a this is not a why don't we put this speckleware pot up here for the time being and put we can put our pot in here and uh, go ahead and put, put uh, get things going in our pot and then we can then we can just uh, we can control the heat somewhat with the uh, uh, by putting more or less fuel in it. Now, when, a, a caution on these things. When I was in Girl Scouts many years ago, we learned that whenever you put a pot over an open fire, you have to soak your pot first. You get some, some uh, uh, detergent and the outside of the pot, then you put it over your open fire. And this is basically an open fire. It's a, I don't know if you probably can't see. So I'll, I'll tip this so you can see it. It's basically an open fire. It's got a really thick wall of insulation around here, so your heat is very concentrated. And it comes up here, but it makes your pot and your hands black. Huh. Um, but, um, and then since you've been uh, smart and you've soaked your pot and you wash your pot off, the soap underneath it will wash all the soot is on the soap and it'll just wash right off. So. So pot first if you use these things, but you um, you can use these to cook cook things in, and then you can use as was suggested over here. Uh, in, what is your name? Annette. Annette. Uh, as Annette suggested, then you can put your uh, pot into a thermal cooker and let the rest of the cooking happen. So, uh, but this is a great way to heat things up. Now there's there's another. Uh, Backpacking type example. You can't take this job, this guy backpacking. That's a bad idea, unless that's all you want to take with. Um, if you want to, so if you want to, this is an interesting concept. I haven't really tested it out too much yet, but it's a it's a great concept. So I'll share it with you. Uh, this has a water jacket on the outside. This is a Kelly kettle. I don't know if you can even get them anymore. I've heard about them for a few years. Internet. Internet. Okay, and Sagan Life, how do you spell that? Yeah, I, I got this at a camping store. Uh, what This has a water jacket around it. So what happens is when you put your chili kettle on top of your uh, um, stove right here, your rocket stove, this is sort of a mini rocket stove on here uh, you just feed in there uh, you put your uh, fuel in there it will heat whatever you have inside the internal container 
And you'll have some hot water at the same time to wash your wash your dishes with. You call this Kelly? It's a Kelly kettle. Yeah. And it comes with its own little pot. Let's see where did that little pot go? Hmm. I'm moving things around here so I can't find them. Yeah. Got a little here. Take the Kelly kettle off of here. Put your little rack on. You can actually grill on this rack if you need to. Got to be more coordinated than I am. And along and you can put your little pot on here. Another, another. All kinds of great things you can do with this. But your little pot. You can boil stuff on the little pot right here. So you, you basically you got a, a little rocket stove, a little a camp stove, and a water jacket here. It's a really kind of a very clever little device. Now, can you, can you think of any? Uh, there's a lot of positives to that. Can you even think of any ideas why it might not be ideal for something? One of the things on the kettle is put sticks in the center pot and bring actually bring the fire up. And then you can put your uh, your tray off so the kelly on the kettle actually that's a stove. Yeah. So you can put your kettle on. Yes, and this, this is something you can take backpacking. Yeah. Now, can you think of a reason why this might not be ideal for some situations? How many people can you feed with a thing of food this big? No, you can't cook for a crowd. You can't even you can cook for a crowd of maybe two people and something like this, which is which is good, but it's a it may not be what you need. Uh, but maybe what you need some of the time. So uh, that leads us, how are we doing okay? That leads us into our, our next uh, couple things. And that's where I'm going to spend, oh, we've got to talk, we can't, can't go off onto these yet. Okay, one of, one of the all time best ways to handle uh, um, cooking for a mob is with a Dutch oven. And I'm not sure where my, okay, they landed here. I put John up here and forgot about putting my Dutch oven back up, so uh, let me uh, get everything back into place here and get the Dutch ovens up here and then we can uh, what, Some of these things I was just showing, uh, with, with the exception of these uh, cookers and the rocket stoves, we're talking about things that are best used for backpacking or in, or small, very small groups. Now, you would not want to take this guy backpacking, I promise. One of the, I think, the all-time best ways to cook food for a group is with a Dutch oven. That's for sure. I, I've got some of both. Uh, I've got a ceramic, one, a ceramic coated one that uh, a cast iron pot, uh, which doesn't have feet on it, which I use in the oven on, on my stove top all the time, and that would be excellent on that. Uh, but it's a uh, can't put coals underneath it very easily. It doesn't have uh, legs. Caring for a Dutch oven or an iron frying pan is very different from stainless steel. Uh, you should never let soap touch it. Now, whenever I went to a scout camp out, somebody inevitably was cooking 
peach cobbler in a Dutch oven lined with aluminum oil. Now, peach cobbler has a very low pH, which means it's acidic, and aluminum is toxic. And mm. these people will not even listen to me, but I would touch that. Now, what you do is you, you take a scrubby and just get all the stuff out of it, uh, and then you oil it, but never soap it. Otherwise, it'll rust. Yeah. And at, yes. at the first time you do it, you're going to want to season it, oil it, and then put it in your and bake it in your oven for uh, several no, no, hours. We, we have comments. Yes, I know. So you should never cook anything on aluminum. I would never cook any. I don't cook on aluminum pans. I don't use anything. Uh, I do not cook in aluminum foil, especially if it's acidic, because the aluminum will leach out into what you're eating, and it's toxic. I stop it. Uh, okay, now you know better. You had a question? Yeah. Um, if in the past the uh, Dutch oven that you're using had been soaked down, is there a ways to counteract yeah. that through seasoning? Yeah. Um, oil. Oil. Um, stick it in the oven and bake it for a while. Yeah. Okay. Bake it at uh, 200 degrees for half an hour. After, after you, after you put, we we use we can use. Uh, uh, Coconut oil to to season it. Just buy some cheap coconut oil or something. There is such a thing. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the the basic way of using a Dutch oven is that uh, um, you uh, you heat you heat up your coal. I didn't bring any charcoal briquettes because I'm not you know they limit to what we can carry. Uh, but you, um, you figure out how many charcoal briquettes that you're going to need. I think it's about 25 degrees for every uh, a charcoal briquette. Yes. Yes, it does. Um, let's see. Uh, this has two quart. I don't know. Does this one doesn't have a number? An eight quart. No, these don't have numbers on them, but it's, it's nice they do. But I think it's about 25 degrees per per charcoal, and you put half. Um, Half of them underneath and half of them on, on half of them on top. You have to if you have, don't quite split in half, put more on top. But uh, so it, so it becomes an oven. You're actually being surrounding the um, items of heat. But you put the, you put their charcoal briquettes in the chimney like this. You light them with a little bit of uh, lighter fluid, and then you let them uh, sit there and cook until they're about halfway white. Then you take them out and you put. Half or slightly less underneath it, underneath it. Uh huh. And make sure you're in a fire pit or something like that where you're not going to don't do that on the table. That'd be a really bad idea. Uh, then, then put you put your food in your uh, um, pot. Put your lid on, and then uh, put the your remaining briquettes on top. Then uh, go off and uh, let it cook. There, there are charts on the internet to tell you how many briquettes to put under and how many briquettes to put over for a certain temperature. Incidentally, uh, you're not going to want to pick up these briquettes with eaters. You need to have a pair of tongs. And you're really uh, well advised uh, if you have, also have, I, I couldn't find my right leather glove this morning, so, okay. But you're well advised to have. Some leather gloves when you're working with this because you're going to uh, burn yourself if you don't do that. What? Well, these gloves are a great idea. And then, uh, it, you know, you're not just limited to you can you can cook a roast in here, you can cook potatoes in here, you can cook vegetables in here, you can cook a dessert in here. Uh, there are a number of others that you can also bake in here. Now, I don't have my pie pan with me, but I do have my bread pan. I've got a cast iron bread pan. You can make your bread, let it raise. Then I put it on a couple of... Um, yeah, um, I, use, I use a couple of... I think I improvise here. A, cu a couple of canning rings. Put them on top of it. And then I now have an I now have an oven and I can bake my bread. It'll bake it quite well. You can also I've also got a cast iron pie plate. You can do pies in. Now let me interrupt one too. more time. I'm going to teach you how to leave how to light a leave no trace fire. 
you can actually light a wood fire on this table, not melt it. Okay? This is how you do it. You get one of those aluminum pans that you cook a turkey in. Okay? They're just a, a cheap, cheap pan. You fill it with about three or four inches of dirt. Okay? Then you light your fire on that. Okay, and you can actually put that on, right on the table. You put your uh, you, you put your stuff on it uh, and cook it. And then when you're done, you disperse the ash. You put the dirt back where it came from. You take that aluminum pie pan, which held the dirt in. You put it back in your pack. This is how you light a leave no trace fire on any surface without burning. Okay, we hope we're not getting overcooked here. Uh, okay, now now you can minimize your use of a uh, uh, fuel and maximize your use of uh, you know maximize your efficiency by using by using one of these volcanoes. I'll move these things out of the road here. Move this belly panel out of the road. Now this is an old style volcano. They've got new collapsible ones that are all fancy and that you can use with propane too. Uh, I don't have new and fancy. I've got old and less expensive. Uh, so deal with it. But uh, with the, um, this has two drills in it. Uh, I tip it right here. It's got a, a low grill right here, a grill on the bottom here. You can take that out, put your briquettes down, your bottom, down and you actually use fewer briquettes uh, with one of these than you do because you're, you're protected. You've got a, an insulated barrier here. And you can just, uh, you can go ahead and grill on top on, on this grill right here if you want, or boil or put something on here and boil it and whatnot uh, if you want. Um, but uh, you can also put your loaded Bread pan in here. I mean, not bread pan. With bread pans in here, I've got these. There's a couple. There's some screws in here, so I can hold up the grill. So I'm relaxing the, the screws. But I can put the. I've got my uh, briquettes down here. So I put my briquettes on top. And if I really want to be fancy, I can take another pot. It can be the same size pot. You can go up three pots. If you want? I put stuff in that. Uh, put. I have, and then the pot, the briquettes on the, the top of this pot also work as the bottom briquettes for this pot. And I put more briquettes on top so I can cook my whole meal all at once with a, with less fuel. So these these things are really handy to have around. So questions or comments? Oh, sorry. What is that skirt around the bottom called? Skirt around the bottom. This skirt. Yes, okay, of, of this, it's about a volcano. And they make the new ones, I think, uh, are collapsible. They take a lot less room. They're, they're lighter weight. Uh, you can use propane with them, but they're basically the same function. Uh, I don't know if these are still available or not. So when you're, uh, when you're doing the briquettes, you, you put lighter fluid on it, and then you light it, yeah. and then wait until they turn white. Yeah, but it's about half the Now, out of briquettes. You, you, you can go ahead and uh, make, build, uh, make some coals from your fire and use those. So this, this, this is a, um, while, while the fuel, you might be using a non-renewable fuel with it, you can have a renewable fuel too, Kenneth. If you have any wind problems, you can take of aluminum foil and wrap it around the outside of that so it doesn't uh, burn up your briquettes too fast. I've cooked my ward several times and we do about 20 uh, Dutch oven cooks. And they're, they're four, uh, four across and five high. Mm -hmm. So you can actually do a third of the meal. You saw those more things do. And we can, we cover it all with just the twenty briquettes. I mean, the twenty uh, Dutch ovens. Yeah, yeah. 
That's can't give away that's all I own. <laughs> that's remarkable. The 300 people with 20 dash ovens, which means you're getting uh, about 15 people per oven, for, for 50 to 20 people per dash oven. And that, that's not unreasonable. Okay, now we're going on to, um, oh, there for the, I, I'm not sure if I got all the questions and comments. Just going to say you could use kindling in there instead of lighter fluid if you don't have it. That works well too. That's a good idea. And you're not going to have lighter fluid forever. So anything that you can morph over to using a renewable fuel like kindling uh, or wood is good. And this is this is one of them. This is a this is a. It, I mean, it's not a back not backpacking gear. You're not going to go very far carrying one of these guys around. But uh, Unless you've got an animal to carry it for you or something, or a hand cart, but uh, it's a, a very versatile, very useful, and very uh, um, sustainable uh, type of cooking. Uh, for the questions or comments, also, oh, and one other thing, you've got to have a lid lifter. Uh, you need to once you have hot, 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 hot. And you're going to use your welding gloves and take this pan off. And then only crazy people uh, do something, you know, pick up the lid with their hands. You lift, lift up a lid with this thing. And you're going to, actually, I don't have a, a lid rack here. You're going to put it on the ground where it's not going to burn something. You're not going to put it on this table to make a big black spot on it. Actually, a welding blanket works really well. Yeah, a welding blanket works. The, the ground works. You can get them on eBay or Amazon or anywhere. The ground can work fine. You can also get uh, various uh, um, tool sets. We haven't messed with this yet, so I can't really talk about it. But uh, you can get a lid holder. Um, you can get lid holders and grills and stuff like that that you can work with in Dutch ovens, too. And so there's Dutch ovens. Now, yes. So if you're using the volcano, you don't have to put it in a fire pit like if you had cement in your backyard. If you were using the volcano, could you still use it on that? Or I didn't fire pit. Right. I know if you don't have a fire pit. Just you like fire on the cement. Yeah, sure fire pit. Just on the cement, you can. Fire pit. It, it provides some insulation, and the, that, that's why it uses less fuel. This is why you. You should buy a welder's blanket so it will protect the cement. Yeah. Good you could just shake the ash off afterwards. Okay. Our next uh, um, project is going to be thermal cookers. Now, uh, thermal cooking has been around for a long time. We have uh, some uh, members of our ward, one of them, he's Tongan. And he, he and his wife put on a luau for our uh, ward in August. And where they basically dug a pit, uh, lined it with stuff, and then uh, threw in a sheep and a, um, and a pig. And so, so and then they they they, they actually they uh, dug the pit. They uh, built a fire inside of it, let the fire simmer down, and they threw the um, meat in and uh, let it cook for several hours and pulled it out and uh, served it. My dad and I have did that on a very limited basis for the scout group a few years ago. We dug a pit and we put a pork roast in. We didn't put a whole pig in. <laughs> uh, but that, that's, that's, what, that's, a, that's a way of thermal cooking. Use a minimal amount of fuel, get it up to temperature, have it in an insulated environment, and uh, let it cook. And it doesn't take very much fuel from it. So what's an insulated way to cook your food if you didn't have, like, I mean, this is better, but, like, because we talk about, like, tinfoil dinners, you know, mm -hmm. and now we're not supposed to use tinfoil. Well, that's where, where I'm headed next. Oh, cool. <laughs> Perfect intro. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, the thermal cooking's been around for a long time. It's been around... Uh, um, I've actually got a cook a few cookbooks here. For, where is it? Where is it? Right here. Oh, I should mention this. Matt Pelton's the cast iron gourmet. I guess he's associated with Camp Chef. Has a cookbook out on the um, the, uh, the Dutch ovens. But this 
This book right here, the fire this cookbook, the manual of the construction and use of appliances for cooking by retained heat with 250 recipes. This was published by Margaret Johns Mitchell. I she might have written Gone with the Wind, I'm not sure. Uh, but this is a circa, she was born in 1869. So this has been around for a long time. Uh, so the basic, the general concept is you bring something to boil, to a boil, get the pot thoroughly hot, then you put it in an insulated environment and let it sit there and cook and continue to cook uh, for several hours. Uh, you can do this in several ways. You can do this uh, uh, by putting it in a separate, uh, I think I think they might have used the, they put it in a, the food in a container, they put it in another container that had water in it, brought it to a boil and wrap it with a blanket. Uh, you can wrap it with a blanket and stick it in your uh, um, ice chest, which acts as an insulation. You can uh, also make, and I did have, I was thinking I would be nice to make one of these things. One of my neighbors uh, demonstrated hers to me the other day, but you can make a um, sort of like a quilt to fit around your pot. It's a, and I got patterns for it if anyone re really wants one. You can get them online, I think. Uh, Debbie Kent, I believe, has some patterns online. I could try you with her email uh, uh, to get that. But you basically build a, build a sort of a round blanket with some slits in it so you can fold it up around, uh, uh, sew it up, fill it full of uh, insulating material, and then you can wrap your pot in that and stick it in your uh, ice chest. Yes. I had years to this uh, come across the plains. My, my family came across in 17 different wagon trains. And so they, they didn't all do it, but in at least eight of them, they had a, what they called a hay box. Yeah. The same thing, the idea. Yeah. They put it on the back of the wagon and uh, they boil something up in the morning. And then by, get, by the time they put to camp, they had a, a cooked dinner. Right. Again, it wasn't all, all the wagon trains, but at least eight of them. Were morning, I kind of did apply that principle. I brought a, 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 um, a, a speckleware pot of chicken, which is even smelling over here in the solar oven, and a pint of bottle of chicken, which is what you've been smelling over here in the funnel cooker. And they, they've been in the refrigerator all night. I actually solar cooked them yesterday. Um, and uh, they were in the refrigerator all night, and they were cold. And I didn't want them to get hot before uh, and spoil before we got here, so I wrapped them in a towel. And when I got out of the uh, car when I got here this morning, they were just as cold as when I put them in the, the uh, car. Now, th those are the, I guess, the low-tech methods of doing it. You get a higher-tech method of doing it, of, of getting a commercial uh, um, thermal cooker. Now, these are Saratoga Jack's thermal cookers. There are several varieties. There, um, there are... A, a vacuum type thermal cookers, where it's like a big vacuum, a big thermos jar, where you have a, actually have two layers. There's a, a, as a matter of fact, I think my water bottle around here, yeah, my water bottle is like a thermos jar. It's got an inner uh, layer and then an outer layer, and the air in between is an insulation which keeps the uh, temperature from, keep the water from getting too hot or too cold or whatever. Um, the, the, they tend to be very expensive, good quality ones. And uh, if, if you drop them or break the seal at all, they're they're useless. Uh, th now this this uh, these these the Saratoga Jacks are the best I've found of the um, insulation type thermal cookers. Now there are several different uh, components to a thermal cooker. First is the, the insulating jacket right here, and this, this has a, a, some kind of a foam insulation inside of it. It's uh, not going to go bad. It's not going to break as easily as a thermos type one that has a vacuum uh, if but if as long as you don't break the inside of uh, the, this inside wall or break the handles or, or whatever you're going to be okay with this with this um, now in, inside the um, if this is your main this is a, this is a I think an eight liter um, it's a, a seven-liter pot. It's a, it'll hold a lot of food. Trust me, a lot of food. Uh, you put your uh, um, your meal or whatever it is you're trying to cook in here. You bring it to a boil, uh, and then you put it in here. 
Now, one of the fundamental principles of thermal cooking, though, is that you have to have a large mass to keep the, uh, keep it hot. If you only fill this thing a quarter of the way full, it's not going to stay uh, hot very long. If you have it all the way, you know, 80% or more, 70, 80% or more full, it'll stay hot up at least above 140 degrees for eight hours. Um, if it's if it's not that way, it's not going to cook too well. So, uh, what do you do? Um, if you don't have, say you have a batch of spaghetti and it's just not that big, or a batch of beans and it's just not that big to fill this whole thing up, how do you get it 80% full? Uh, well, first of all, you bring it to a, this to a boil, you let it boil for X amount of time, and I'll talk about specific ingredients in a few minutes. Uh, and it's nice and hot. You put the lid on it, and here's the lid. You put it in here, but it's not full enough. How do you get it more full? There are a couple of alternatives. This is a second pot, a two and a half liter pot that fits right in on top of it in this. You can do one of two things. You can cook something else in it. You can have your dinner down here and your dessert up here. Uh, or you can have, if you don't have, or you can make, you can cook some rice for, net, for tomorrow's meal. Or you can cook some rice to put your stew on top of. Uh, or just hot water. It's bring, bring the water to a boil, you stick it in, and then you have your pot that's more than 80% full. Put the lid on, close it, and let it sit there and cook uh, for up to eight hours. Now, you need to test that. If you're not sure about it, use the test and periodically and make sure it's uh, uh, make a test that make sure it's at least staying 140 degrees. After 140 degrees, you have two hours to bring it back up to boil. You can bring it back up to boiling and recook it, or you can toss it, uh, one or the other, so you don't get food poisoning. But these work extremely well. Now, what do you do if you just have a, this? Will this will be the uh, 12 to 20 people. This, this is a big pot. So what do you do if you've got a smaller family, like two of us? You're not going to eat that much food. And when, I, when I do potlucks, yeah, I take that guy. He's, he's big. Uh, you can get a, a five and a half liter one, which is a lot smaller. Now, I'm not going to open this quite yet. One of the cardinal rules of thermal cooking is thou shalt not open thy thermal cooking pot until thou art ready to serve the food. <laughs> If you open you open the thermal cooking pot before that time. There it goes. Questions. How do you check the temperature? You okay. Can't open it. Okay. Um, you do your temperature hey. test uh, at a different time. You do your temperature test and make sure that you see how long it's fill it up full with uh, water or something. Then yeah, like if here. you're practicing making something, yeah. see how it turns out. Um, well, uh, uh, try it several times and take a temper take a temperature test each time, but or Plan on reheating it if, if uh, it's not up there. So just practice and testing. There's no simple answer on that one. <laughs> Except that if you just fill it up with water and boil it and open it and then do it again. Okay. Anyway, I've got some uh, uh, a zucchini parmesan in here, which everyone is welcome to have have a sample of at when we get done here. And I'll open it at this time. That, that's why I'm not opening it right now, and that's why I brought this big guy to go off. Okay. Uh, now, oh, I forgot to talk about bread. You can also bake in one of these things, which is, a, this, by the way, this is a small pan. The zucchini parmesan was 80% full, so I couldn't bring this. You can also, let's see, where did I put my, thank you. Okay, well, I'm not done with uh, the solar cooker. Do you want me to solve the solar cooker? Okay. Now, you can, you can also bake. Uh, you can bake bread. You can bake uh, cookies. Oh, not cookies, but you can bake uh, um, cupcakes and, uh, oh, gosh. You see, you can bake bread in one of these little things. And what you do, and I'm not, I can't open this guy, so I'll have to demonstrate with this guy. What you do to bake stuff in here is you let your you only, you don't fill it more than halfway full. This this this, this is, a, is a pot that has a lid. This is what it looks like inside. Now this thing's a trivet. And what you do to bake, bake your bread is you put it on the bottom of your uh, pot. You put your bread dough in halfway full, and you rate your 
if you make yeast bread in it, uh, let, if you're using uh, regular yeast, uh, don't, uh, don't raise it first. It'll raise while it's cooking. If you're using a, a sourdough start like I do, let it raise a bit, but don't fill it more than about halfway full. Then you make sure the pot's greased. You put your lid on. You close it. And then you put it inside your large pot and fill it. And then you bring it and uh, you fill it, fill it up with water just up to you don't you don't submerge submerge it. But you, you fill it up just up to the uh, this this line here, and then uh, you put it in your thermal cooker and let it cook. And let it cook for at least two to two to four hours. Now it, you won't have a crust, you won't have a hard crust, uh, but it, it'll be soft and moist. But it's very good. You can also cook cupcakes and stuff like that in half pint glass jar, half pint glass jars that don't have. Uh, Next on them. So questions or comments? This is this is a very versatile. What you cannot do, you cannot grill. You cannot get anything that needs to be crisp. Um, and if you're using any of these modalities, uh, it's going to be hard to do something uh, that requires baking. Now this one, I, this is not a boiled item, uh, so normally this wouldn't be a, I guess, a legitimate uh, thermal cooker kind of thing because it has you have to boil it. First, uh, because the water is really the cooker. But what I did with this one is I baked it for half an hour and stuffed it in here, and it's still hot. So if you have access to an oven, you can do that. If you don't have access to an oven, that's not an option. But it's an awfully good way to bring uh, something that's a hot to and keep it hot at a um, at, to a large gathering like this. Questions or comments before I go on? Use a, use, a thermo, use a thermometer. Do you just test the water before you put it in to make sure it's hot enough? Well, if the water is what was boiling to, to, if you're at sea level, it'll boil at 212 degrees. You might want to test it to see what okay. your altitude, it'll vary with your altitude. Okay. Uh, that's why we were running out of the uh, fuel in uh, the high windows, is because things boil at a much lower temperature. Okay, now we're going on to solar cooking. This is, a, if you want to use a source of free fuel, this is it. 93 million miles away, but anyway. So I must, I must have missed it, but how are you getting the bread hot enough without boiling it before you put it in there to cook? Okay, so the, the, I'm getting the bread hot enough. The bread is getting hot enough because I'm putting it in here. Maybe I better go back to that procedure again. I wasn't. Evidently, wasn't clear. The bread is. I'm putting water in in, in here. Up up. Um, <laughs> there, see, there's a rim right here. You want the water below the rim. You don't want to submerge it. Uh, put the water in here. Bring it to a boil. Um, for most breads, you're going to boil it for about 10 minutes. Uh, for a sourdough bread, you boil it for 20 minutes. Then you then you remove it from the stove. Put it in here. Put the lid on it and let it cook for at least two to four hours. Okay, thanks, like thanks for putting that. What about meat? Like, what do you need in there? Like, how long do you need to boil the water to cook meat? Okay, meat. Like, um, well, if it's, if it's shredded up uh, about two minutes, it's about two to four minutes. If it's a uh, um, chunked beef, about four minutes. If it's a pot roast, you're going to want to boil it about 15 minutes. On there's a book. And here's here is a here's the Bible right here. It's a Cindy Miller's Let's Make Sense of Thermal Cooking cookbook. And she will walk you through every bit of it. Now there are a couple a couple of recipes I wanted to talk about. We're going to talk about cooking rice. Uh, with white rice, she suggests uh, uh, cooking the white rice in one of these upper containers. Um, and I think for white rice, you'd probably use a cup and a half about a cup of rice, a cup of water, or two cups of rice, two cups of water, and a teaspoon of salt. And uh, you're going to bring it to a boil. Uh, 
for, about, for white rice, two minutes, for brown rice, four minutes. And then stick it in your crock pot, your thermal cooker, and let it go. Uh, for beans, now we're, we're, we've been eating chili this week. I thermal cook the beans. For beans, you soak the beans overnight. To soak them, I, I like to do a pound at a time and then freeze dry. We either eat, uh, serve at a potluck or freeze dry what's left over. And uh, the, um, the procedure for soaking them is no matter how much you use, dump the beans in a container, use a purified water if you can. Uh, the chlorinated water tends to leave your beans tough. The chlorine that makes it a little harder for them to tenderize. So use purified water, cover them oh, several inches deep over the beans because they will swell up and eat up all the water overnight. Let them soak overnight. That will do a couple things. That'll take care of the phytic acid, take them out, and the polysaccharides. Those are the components that make beans gassy. You get rid of those, you don't have gas in the beans. Uh, typically. And then uh, the, once that those have soaked overnight, pour that water off, rinse the beans, and then put them in your thermal pot. Uh, cover the thermal pot with water, cover the beans with water, put them on the stove, boil them for about 10, 15 minutes. If they're old, you give them 20 minutes. But uh, newer beans, 10 minutes is fine. Stick them in a the thermal pot and let them go for about six to eight hours. That's, that's what I did with these. Then I pulled them out. I already had the uh, mixture made for the um, the meat mixture made and the tomatoes. Just mixed them up. I threw them back in the pot. Uh, and I, while I heat, I boiled them in the pot in the um, tomato sauce for about 10 minutes and uh, threw them back in the thermal cooker for another couple, two to three hours. And lo and behold, really good chili. Beans work really, really well in a thermal cooker, and they take as you now. I didn't, I didn't catch your name, uh, oh. Annette. Yeah, Annette. As Annette suggested, you use a lot less fuel cooking your beans uh, if you do that. If you have a, if if you have some really old beans and they don't tenderize, just try to just try cooking them again, and then then and if they don't tenderize after that, grind them up and use them for something else. <laughs> but, uh, we have about three minutes. Oh, I only have three minutes left. Yeah. Okay, we got more than three minutes. Okay, solar yeah. cooking. This is a biggie, and this, this is this is one I use all the time. Okay, for solar cooking, you need um there are two different there are different modalities for solar cooking. Um, most of them I consider to be too expensive, in impractical, and it's in some cases dangerous. That's one that's a, par a parabolic solar cooker. And it, it uh, um, I'd be afraid to have that in my yard because I'm afraid of the fire danger from it and, and burning danger. Anyway, my favorite way of solar cooking is with a, a global sun oven. The global sun, this, this, uh, there are several components to it. One is this, uh, a cook, this black cooking box. There's a, those of you who are looking at it, you notice there's an adjustable uh, uh, bar on the back, which allows the, the um, which allows this to be raised or lowered. What you're trying to do is get the direct sun. Low, earlier in the day, uh, you have it raised higher so that the uh, you get the lower sun. Then as the sun goes up in the sky, then you can lower the, and so you have the direct sun shining down on it. If you rotate it every, uh, oh, 20 minutes or so, you can actually keep it uh, to a pretty constant temperature. So you can approximate an oven with that. Today we were running about 325 degrees. Uh, now, if you want more of a, a slow cooker type approach, then you can just park it right here in the, sort of the mid mid uh, area. Then go around. Then then you go off and go hiking, go go play, come back to a nice hot dinner. Takes a little longer to cook that way, but that's okay. There's an adjustable rack in here which will adjust with the angle of the um, <clears throat> box. These are reflectors here. This is the tempered glass door. There are latches here. And if you're going to solar cook, you need to close the latches. Uh, and if you're going to be, you can dehydrate or you can raise your bread in there, in which case you don't want to close it. You'll just put it like that. <clears throat> 
this little guy fell off. But this is a, a little a locator. This, this helps you locate the sun. It's the angle of the sun, and you can just line up the sun uh, and to know, know exactly how it's going to work out. Uh, keep it, it, it shine, the sun shines down here and shines on a spot, and if the, the little light spot's on the spot, then you know that you're pointing in the right direction. So there are a number of different things. Okay, I think we're running out of time too. Uh, this is the most important one though. We got started late, so I might go a little bit late. Uh, there's the best way, the best things to cook in a solar cook in a solar cooker are uh, the the, the specular pot. You have to have a middle, a dark, dull surface container. Uh, the glass containers don't work well. Uh, the 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 heat just goes right through them and they don't absorb. So you speckleware pots. You it's can use graniteware. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I blow it with speckleware. They look like speckleware to me. Uh, um, you, can you use a, a cast iron in that? Yes, you can. It takes longer to heat up. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay, I have a fan oven. I've never used it. Why did you put? You said you were afraid it would start a fire. No, the parabolic dish. There, oh. uh, there, 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 are, there are some. There are some. They're long and skinny. Uh, um, that don't, aren't aren't really efficient because you have to chop everything up very small and you can't cook very much. And then there's one that's in the sort of like a big you know, parabola. It's like oh, a big that big okay. antenna, and uh, then it for uh, heat, you can get very hot and you can grill stuff. It's very fast to cook with. Um, if someone touches it, it'll probably be in an emergency room. So they're very Why dangerous. Do you, it's like a box. Those four reflectors are specifically designed so that your food can't get warm. That's a very strong substance. So if they were any bigger, it would cook. Can you use this during the winter? Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. The, the times to use this, and I'm I'm sort of going off. He's sort of pressuring me for time, but the the, the best times to use these are in the period of direct sun during the day. And that would be in the winter between uh, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So you cook your your dinner then, and then uh, you can keep it warm in the oven for about two hours after that. Pull this, pull the reflectors down, and it'll stay warm. So uh, have your dinner early around four. Uh, you, um, where was I? All right, that back to pans. This is a this is great for cooking roasts and ch small chickens. Don't don't try to cook a turkey. You can't have to try to cook a whole turkey in there, and it has to work too well. You have you have to have something that's going to absorb the heat. And that that it, that it's in. You just can't put something. Uh, and uh, then let's see. I'm not done. Uh, and then uh, if you're going to, you, you can also cook. You can bake cookies. You, you can bake cakes. You can bake pies. You can bake bread. Uh, for, bread pans, um, for bread, you just uh, um, you can use a bread pan like this. this. This came with it. This is one of the friends of mine made. He passed away, so he can't make any more. But I've got some bread in here, which we're welcome to eat afterwards. Uh, this is uh, some zucchini bread, and it takes about an hour and a half to cook it. Uh, this this is a uh, what it looks like. I it's a uh, I'm not sure, but it's it's dark and it really absorbs the heat well. Uh, this works well too. You can also bake cookies. Uh, cookie, cookies uh, um, you can put about Six to eight cookies on one of these uh, cookie sheets. Uh, they, they actually, you have to get into what cookies are. Yeah. You just cross stack these guys on top of each other and keep cook more than once. You're not worrying about, you don't have any water evaporating. And, and so, so things will stay very moist and tender. Uh, the food I cooked in there for today, uh, I'm not sure where John put it. It's it's hot. You just, when you when you're handling stuff, 
you must use hot pads. You will burn your hands if you don't use hot pads. So you, um, anyway, I put just put some chicken thighs in there. I put food group number seven, AKA garlic salt on the chicken thighs. I uh, put them, uh, dumped a bottle of tomatillo salsa on top of it, dumped some onions on top of that, and then let it go. And that's uh, what you're cooking right here. Um, and so you can cook your whole meal. But what you cannot do in a solar oven is grill or, or uh, um, fry stuff. You're not going to grill or fry stuff in there. You can in a, in a Dutch oven, you can't in here. Uh, but you can cook just about anything you want. And I use my I use my uh, solar oven as a auxiliary all the time. It's the best way I know of to cook a pork roast. You haven't had a tender pork roast when you've had one cooking one of them. Things don't dry out in there. They don't generally overcook, although bread and the uh, uh, cookies can overcook. So some things will, can overcook. Um, the best thing I can recommend, I'm not, I think uh, that the, well, the, the uh, all American Sun Oven Company just put out a new cookbook. I haven't ordered it yet, but mostly just sort of mess around with it and see what works. What I've been doing. now, just just for a real quick thing, this is a, if you can't afford the whole the whole kit and caboodle a couple of years ago was costing about four hundred and fifty dollars. So these are not cheap. If you want to do a, a cheap way of uh, solar cooking, you can still do it. This is called a funnel cooker, developed by Dr. Stephen Jones while he was at BYU. And it costs under about around fifteen dollars to make one of these guys. So you have I've got a five gallon bucket here. This this is a uh, a metal. This is this is a mylar uh, win window. Uh, I bound it with bi bias tape. It's got about a five inch circle cut out in the middle there where I'm putting the um, the cooking thing. I'm holding it open with two snakes, which are three out of our uh, pile. Um, Okay, hot pad. Where'd my hot pad go? I had my hot pad here so I could use it. Okay, hot pad. Uh, yeah, this guy's still hot. The cooking container here. Um, back to the components before I go to the cooking container. But um, this is uh, inside here. A quart bottle on its head. Um, one of these uh, electric stove uh, things on here is a reflector. Put that on top of it. Then I put the put my reflector on top of that. Then I put my cooking container on top of that. Theoretically, I could probably use a specialware container, but as a practical matter, it's cooking vertically is a little better. So depending on how much you're cooking, and you again, you need to fill the bottle pretty much full. I tried doing this bottle. Partially full, it was a bad idea, it didn't cook well. Uh, this is a two gallon uh, quart jar. Two quart. It has. It, and you spray painted that black. Uh huh. Now I put, I put a, um, it's really handy uh, to, and we'll, we'll, you can see this, you can pass this around. I cooked, I cooked a loaf of zucchini bread in here. And so you can see, you can actually see what's going on inside of it. So you painted the jars themselves? Yes. And what did you paint them with? Okay, and that's what it's right here. I put a stripe of a cheap black black spray. A stripe. Anything. I put a stripe of a of a masking tape down here to mask it. And then this is a a duplicolor vinyl and fabric specialty coating, flexible finish, ideal for dash for door panels, seats, and carpet. What a dull black black paint. And just spray it, let it dry, and then you've got a nice dark container that will cook things in it. Now we've got another container. Uh, I've got a one quart jar in this hot. Okay, now you have to have an insulation here. And this makes it a lot more effective. Uh, it doesn't cook nearly as fast without the bag. This is made a rental turkey, turkey oven bag. One of these. Turkey bag. And I, I just reuse these. I just, I've been reusing this one for several years. Uh, but this has some, this has some of the chicken uh, tomatillo salsa in it too. Now it takes longer to cook things in in, in the uh, globe, in the funnel cooker than it does in the sun oven. It's not as reliable, and you can't bake in it. Uh, 
Well, you can. You can bake, you can bake bread in it. But uh, the bread has to be, where does, where does that bread go? Okay. Note, note, the, note that it is a straight lid bottle. I tried cooking some bread in a one that had sort of in a little bit. It, it, it cooked. It cooked just fine, but I, taking it out, it looked like dog food when I took it out. <laughs> so, and if you want to get it out in one piece, you've got to use a straight a straight neck. So you're kind of stuck with a hat with a pint bottle. And I'm sure he was. He has some quart bottles that are straight neck. Uh, Shireen Wadsworth, Alpine Food Storage. Yeah. Yes. Oh, you didn't see you. You haven't seen the one that's being passed around. You can see what's going on inside that open jar. To open a jar, you need your. Uh, you don't open the jar, but you have the stripe. You can see it if it's red dry. You know, it's to that, that's that why. Okay. So um, I, I didn't go into quite the detail on the solar cooking that I'd like to go on, uh, uh, go go into, but. I think we're out of time and probably have to eat something. Yes. I could. That was sort of low priority. Uh, a friend of mine uh, made this uh, Donna Hoover, if any of you know Donna Hoover. Uh, you can use this as an inexpensive way to um, bake stuff and cook stuff. It's basically an apple box that's been covered with foil. Uh, she, I think she glued it on with a foil. There, there are supposed to be four of these uh, containers right here. You weight these four containers down with a box in them. That keeps it from blowing away. You, uh, you use about half the number of uh, coals that you need for the, the equivalent thing in a Dutch oven. You uh, heat up your coal. You, you, cook, you uh, get your coals going and put them in this pan here. And then you can and you put your uh, pans on top. And you put your pan on top of this and uh, let it uh, let it cook. Uh, you put your pan on top of it, and actually there is a, a wall here, and then you put the lid on, and then just let it cook. And this is something you can do for less than five dollars. Well, theoretically, it takes. I I haven't really done too much with it, but theoretically, it's just like using a regular oven. So probably your same amount of time. Okay, well, now I guess I better start serving up some uh, goodies. We brought some paper plates and some forks, and so.